Um, welcome everyone. <clears throat> welcome everyone to the XR Access uh, seminar from the Research Network. Today's speaker will be Jaylene Her Hers. Ah, I checked the pronunciation before, but I struggled with it a lot. No Her Herkowski. Herkowski. And uh, we're excited to have her here today and also have you all today for the seminar. We hope to see more of you come to the upcoming seminars because we will keep uh, having new and interesting speakers and leaders in the XR accessibility field. But yeah, um, can you go to the next slide, Mojita? Um, so, uh, I am Ricardo Gonzalez. I'm a first, uh, second year PhD student in the information science department at Cornell Tech. I personally work in accessibility for low vision, well, visually impaired people actually, because I have done a few things for blind people too. Um, and I am advised by Shiri Asenkot. As some of you may know, and maybe some of you may not know, Shiri is one of the directors of the XR Access Initiative, and she's one of the leaders of the XR Access Research Network. And Mahika and I are her students, and we're helping her out um, for now manage these seminars, but we also are trying to look into new opportunities in the future for collaborations, funding opportunities, but that's still... Um, under construction. Um, so, and to briefly present my colleague, Mahika Futane. She is also a second year PhD student uh, in the computer science department at Cornell Tech, and she's also advised by Shiri. Her work has been focused on speech interfaces mainly um, and the accessibility about speech interfaces. Um, and she has, she had also uh, some experience developing uh, accessible VR um, input techniques. Um, I think we can go to the next slide. So what is the XR Access Initiative for those of you who have not uh, been here before? Um, the XR Access Initiative was founded in 2019, and basically we're a community that engages, connects, and influences the field of XR. How? By bridging the gap between industry and academia and creating a space to make accessibility adoption easier, but also more uh, viable, like having a place where we can together work towards XR accessibility. We can go to the next one. Yep. And now I will leave things to my colleague, Mahika. All right. Thanks for the introductions, Ricardo. So um, just to wrap up really quickly, this is the Research Network Seminars. Here we just invite speakers to share their latest work and breakthroughs in making XR technologies accessible. So we have the wonderful Jalen here today. Um, and through these seminars and discussions, we invite speakers to share what they have been working on and then sort of talk and have discussions around actually disseminating and applying some of this research work. That'll be very exciting. So to briefly introduce the, the speaker today. Um, so today's speaker is Jalen Herskovsky, a PhD student at University of Michigan and a researcher at the Human AI Lab that's directed by Professor Anne Hong Guo at the Computer Science and Engineering Department there. She's passionate about creating AR tools for accessibility and collaboration. And her work has been published at top research venues, including Kai and Assets. She was recently awarded the NSF Graduate Research Fellowship. And as a PhD student myself, I know how prestigious and amazing that achievement itself is. So we're lucky to have her here today to talk about her work. 
and I'll hand it off to you. So please give a warm welcome to Jay Lynn. Oh, thank you. That was a, a, a very nice introduction. I really appreciate it. Um, okay, so can I share my screen now? Let's While Jay Lynn shares her screen, um, she will be giving more, uh, multiple talks about different projects and we will have maybe small pauses between those projects so you can type your questions in the chat um, and we will then go to them after the end of it, each small talk yeah well it's your yeah, turn totally, now Dave. yeah totally feel free to put questions in the chat at any point um, and i'll try to get to them at the end of discussing each project uh primarily just discussing one main paper today um, and then a couple of small ones at the end. So yeah. Um, um, yeah, so my name is Jalen Herskovitz. I'm a third year PhD student at the University of Michigan advised by Anhan Guo. And the broad goal of my research is to make augmented reality accessible and, and useful to everyone. And today I'll mostly discuss visual accessibility specifically. So um, yeah, I'd like to talk a little bit about my work on this topic and I'll present a few projects of mine and discuss the questions that they can open for AR accessibility. So augmented reality or AR enhances our capabilities and experiences by overlaying virtual information onto the world around us. And while this virtual content can come in different forms, most often it's in the form of visual augmentation as shown in this video clip where a dinosaur appears to be standing on a basketball court. Um, but mobile AR is becoming popular for a, a wide variety of use cases. So here I show two examples. On the left is IKEA Place, which lets the user see what furniture will look like in their home before they buy it. Um, and on the right is Statue of Liberty, an educational AR app, um, and this lets the user explore a life-size version of the monument and learn fun facts about it by tapping on certain points of the model. And like the previous video, this content is also primarily visual. Um, and additionally, these applications don't expose the meaning of the 3D content to screen readers. So if I open these apps while using a screen reader, I may be able to learn what buttons are on the screen, but I can't learn anything about the AR content or how it's placed in my environment, rendering the app useless to people with visual impairments. Um, and then on top of that, even if I could navigate over the 3D content with a screen reader, these applications often rely on interactions that are not accessible. So uh, for example, like requiring the user to aim the camera at a specific uh, lo uh, location or, or object, and then tap the screen at a specific place. So solving these problems is just a piece of the path towards making AR fully accessible. So I wanna take a step back quickly and just take a look at the larger picture of this research roadmap. So first we can look at making single user AR applications accessible. And the first step towards doing this is to identify the basic interactions that are required to use AR applications and develop accessible alternatives. So today I'll, I'll primarily discuss my work towards this point in my paper, making mobile AR applications accessible. Um, and then from this work, we also identified some key next steps, including the need to create alternatives for more complex AR interactions, and the need to further involve the physical environment in sensing and descriptions. And I'll uh, discuss these points more later on. I'll also look at how collaboration and multi-user applications fit into this roadmap, and I'll briefly discuss two other projects at the end. Um, so I'll, I'll get to those more later, but to summarize, all of these projects are sort of aimed at the same central goal, namely to make AR fully accessible and useful for everyone. And by addressing this goal, I actually aim to have two main effects. First is the immediate effect of making existing AR accessible. Uh, while this may not seem urgent, providing a base level, uh, baseline level of access to AR is important as no technology should be inaccessible and AR is no exception to that. Second, in the long term, by coming up with accessible interaction techniques for AR technologies and interfaces that can be widely deployed on a variety of devices, we hope to see more assistive applications being easier to create and thus more publicly available. So let me give a few examples of what I mean by assistive applications in this context, and some of these might look familiar to y'all. Um, so in order to make AR content appear on top of the real world, there's a lot of complex camera sensing and tracking that goes on behind the scenes. And these sort of related mobile sensing technologies have been shown to be extremely useful in improving the accessibility of a variety of physical tasks. So for example, VisLens provides access to flat touchscreen interfaces by recognizing buttons and guiding people to press the right one. 
NavCog is a navigation assistant which uses spatial audio and camera sensing to provide users feedback and directions as they walk through a space. Um, Stairlight provides visual augmentations to make stairs easier to navigate for low vision people. Um, and similarly, QC provides visual highlights and directions to make finding objects easier. Um, and this is just a small set of examples. Um, but these assistive applications um, are typically built by researchers to accomplish specific tasks, which is a long time consuming process. So making these applications easier to create and deploy is an important secondary effect of this research. And this mirrors the process that we see in the research space for VR as well. So in VR, we've seen a lot of research focusing on making VR accessible. So for example, seeing VR presented a toolkit um, to make VR more accessible to people with low vision through a series of visual modifications and enhancements. And cane troller is another example, which presented a haptic white cane device um, that blind users could use to navigate virtual reality spaces. And additionally, we see a lot of research that uses VR technology for assistive applications like navigation training. Um, so these are not two separate goals, but they actually influence each other. And uh, these two research tracks actually borrow a lot of techniques from each other. So research in one of these areas can accelerate research in the other. So in the space of AR accessibility, by making existing augmented reality applications accessible, I hope to contribute to the cycle and thus to the broader goal of making AR that's not only accessible, but that is useful for everyone. Okay. So with all that said, today I'll primarily discuss my paper on making mobile augmented reality applications accessible. This work was conducted uh, at a research uh, internship I did at Apple uh, with support from some great collaborators. Um, and as I mentioned before, existing mobile AR applications cannot be used with a screen reader at all. So our goal here was to begin to make these applications accessible. And our approach to doing this consists of three main parts. First, in order to understand how to make AR apps accessible, we performed an analysis of the functionality of existing AR apps. And this was done with the goal of uncovering common tasks in AR apps that are in need of accessible counterparts. Second, we developed prototypes of non-visual alternatives to three common tasks that we identified um, to act as design probes. And finally, we conducted a study to explore how 10 blind participants interacted with AR on mobile devices. So first, for our analysis of existing AR apps, we conducted all apps that were featured on the AR section of the App Store over a three-month period during the summer of 2019. And this resulted in a set of 105 apps across various categories. So most of these are either educational um, or for entertainment, such as AR games, drawing, or social applications. Um, and a good chunk of apps were also used for retail, uh, which was primarily furniture shopping or utility, which was primarily AR measurement applications. And then once these apps were collected, three members of our research team performed a thematic analysis of this data set, coding each app for the AR tasks or operations that were required to use it. So from this analysis, we formed five broad categories of AR tasks. First, establishing physical virtual correspondence, which includes tasks necessary to establish AR tracking. Second, creating virtual content, which includes different methods used to place content in the space. Observing AR content, which includes tasks that allow the user to gain information about the look of virtual content and its layout in the space. Transforming virtual content, which includes moving, rotating, scaling, or deleting content. And finally, a category which we called activating virtual content. Um, this is a broad category, which includes uh, any task where a user selects an object in the scene. And this may result in additional effects, such as the object changing state to become editable or an animation playing. So from this analysis, we also quantified how common certain component tasks were. So here I'm just going to mention a few of the most common operations, and I'll talk more about the less common tasks later on. So for example, um, in the category of establishing physical virtual correspondence, um, scanning the environment generally to establish tracking was the most common task that apps required of users. But other tasks, such as requiring the user to scan a specific object, were also present. In the category of creating virtual content, placing content on a physical surface was the most common task, um, as opposed to other methods like placing content in midair or drawing with a finger. And finally, for observing AR content, um, by definition, we 
identify this in every AR application, but we felt that it was important to explicitly describe some of the goals that this accomplishes um, just so that we can capture this information non-visually. Um, so for example, one common goal is to compare two objects to each other in terms of size, location, or look. Um, so in a furniture shopping app, I might place a chair in my space and then compare its size to an existing chair that I have or its color to other furniture and see if it matches. Um, and we describe more of these goals in our paper as well. So based on the prevalence of these component tasks that we measured, we chose three of the most common tasks to create accessible alternatives for. So this includes scanning an environment to find surfaces, which was present in 80% of the apps in our set, placing a virtual object at a point in space, which was present in 65% of the apps in our data set, and finally locating a virtual object in space, which was present in all of the apps that we looked at. And then for these tasks, we prototype non-visual alternatives, one for scanning the environment, two for placing content on a surface in the scene, and two methods for finding the location of virtual content in the scene. Um, so next, I'll describe our goals when designing each of these prototypes, and I'll describe how each one works. So in designing these non-visual prototypes, we followed three general goals. First, we didn't want any of our prototypes to rely on precise camera aiming and tapping. Um, and as I mentioned before, this is a common interaction for all sorts of uh, actions in current mobile AR, where the user has to aim the camera at a specific uh, object and then tap a point on the screen to do something like play something or interact with something. Um, so we really wanted to avoid this. Second, we wanted to retain some level of having three-dimensional content. And third, we wanted to provide access by familiar screen reader controls. So our scanning app provides updates, uh, progress updates through voiceover when the user scans new surfaces and periodically updates them on the surface area of scan. So I'll play a quick demo. Walk around the room and slowly pan the camera to scan. New horizontal plane found. New horizontal plane found. New horizontal plane found. Scan three surfaces, total of 3.9 square meters. New vertical plane found. Okay, I hope that y'all could hear the audio there. Okay, and then um, next, our first for our first object placement app, which we called camera-based placement, um, the phone's location is used to determine the location of the virtual object that's being placed. Um, so as the user walks around the space, the virtual object kind of follows the phone just like the user is holding it um, and it's placed on the nearest surface to them. Um, and in this prototype, uh, only the location of the phone is used to determine the object's position and not the camera angle. Um, and the object is always projected downwards onto the nearest surface. Confirm, button, you are now holding a base. Base move to a new surface. Confirm. For our second object placement app, which we called Guided Placement, um, the app generates candidate positions for an object based on the available surfaces that have been scanned. Um, and then it asks the user a series of questions to place the object. Where would you like to place the object? On the floor, button. Where on the floor? In the center, in a corner, on an edge, button. Face the edge that you would like to place the object on, then press the confirm button below to place the object. Confirm. Button. Confirm. Okay, next for our first object finding app, which we called Camera Based Search, the app provides verbal feedback about the objects as the user pans the camera around the space. Found blue chair 1.6 meters away. Left blue chair. Found purple vase 0 0.6 meters away. Close to the purple vase. And finally, for our second object finding app, which we call Guided Search, um, the user first selects an object from a list, and they're then given periodic uh, verbal directions to its location. Objects. Gray chair, pink, black chair, button. Black chair is 1.1 meters to the right. Black chair is 1.0 meters to the right. Black chair is 0 0.6 meters to the right. Black chair is 0 0.4 meters in front of you. Black chair is zero, close to the black chair. 
Okay, so then with these five prototypes, uh, we then created two apps that combine them into complete AR applications. And these were meant to mimic common existing AR apps. So we had a furniture layout app and educational solar system app. So in the furniture app, users can select objects from a list and place them using the camera-based placement method where they walk around the room holding the object. And then once placed, they can find them again with the camera-based search method by panning their camera around the space. Add furniture button. Cancel button items. Mahogany chair with blue cushion button. Maho Confirm placement. You are now holding the mahogany chair with blue cushion. Item doesn't fit here. Item fits here. Confirm placement. Found mahogany. Add furniture. Button. Left mahogany. Um, and then lastly, in our solar system app, uh, users first place an educational model of the solar system in their environment. Um, and if there's animations that are played, they're described verbally. And then to find objects, they use the camera-based search method again, where they pan the camera around. And then once an object is found, they can select it to learn more about it. Continue. Face an empty area of the room, then press the confirm button below to place the planets in front of confirm button, confirm. A model of the solar system appears. This model is approximately 161 millionths the size of the actual solar system. Next button, next. For example, the Earth model here is 8 centimeters wide, but Earth is actually almost 8,000 miles wide. Next. Button. Next. An animation place that resizes all planets so they are each 30 centimeters wide. Select a planet to learn more about it. Found Jupiter 0 0.9 meters away. Conf found Mark. Confirm. Button. Confirm. Found Jupiter 0. An animation place that... Okay, and then now for some details about our evaluation. So we ran a user study with 10 participants eight who were completely blind and two with full vision, where they were asked to use each of the apps that I mentioned previously. So each individual prototype was evaluated sh with short tasks. For example, users were asked to scan a certain number and area of surfaces for tracking. Um, they were asked to complete five prompts for placing an object. Uh, for example, place the chair in front of the desk as there was a physical desk in our study area. Um, and they were also asked to locate five virtual objects that were placed semi-randomly around the space. Um, and then for the two full AR apps, uh, we just asked participants to try them until they felt that they were done. And finally, participants answered a set of Likert scale and open-ended questions after each task. So because participants used all of our prototypes, we can compare the methods that we developed for the same task. So between camera-based placement, where the user is walking around holding the virtual object, and guided placement, where the user picks a location from a list, um, participants generally preferred camera-based placement um, because it gave immediate and continuous feedback about the placement of an object. Um, so participants could use their navigation skills and mental model of a space to get to the location that they wanted. So for example, one participant said, all I had to do was move to the location and place it. I knew when something wouldn't fit, and so I just backed off and then placed it. Um, and then while guided placement, the method where they uh, selected a location from a list was usable, it lacked some semantic information and precision. So for example, another participant said, uh, there were only three options. There wasn't enough precision to do what I wanted to do. And this could potentially be mitigated by um, automatically generating better placement options in the future. Um, next, between the two search mechanisms, participants strongly preferred guided search, where they selected an object from a list and then got directions to it, um, as using the camera search mechanism to scan the room for unknown targets in our task could be tedious. So one participant said, if I knew what I was looking for, it would have been a lot easier. For example, the purple vase, I knew it was on the table, but if I had known there were two things on the table to start with, then when I had found one, I might have looked for the other. However, this effect could be mitigated when participants were familiar with the layout of the space, for example, in our furniture app when they place them in the space themselves. Um, this is also something that could vary based on a participant's level of vision and how long they've been blind, um, as they may understand the space differently. And this is something that we discuss more in our paper. From participant comments on the two full AR applications, 
we note that AR has the potential to be useful in certain tasks, uh, but it might not be the optimal solution in all cases. So about the furniture app, one participant said, I liked it. It was cool to be able to place things like that. I guess that would save you from having to measure the furniture and go to the store um, and do that. However, about the educational solar system app, another participant noted that tactile models would have been better suited to the task, saying, for a kid that can't see, bring them something they can touch and feel to give them an idea of the setup. You still need more haptic information. Once they have the setup, they can stop and learn about each planet. So this is just early stage feedback. Um, and with it, we hope to highlight the need for future work that assesses the practicality of AR for a wider variety of tasks. So in general, we observe that accessible interactions with AR need to not only provide continuous and meaningful feedback, but also mixed descriptions of both physical and virtual objects. So participants requested information on the physical objects around them for a variety of purposes. Um, so for one example, physical objects could serve as guidance to help participants locate or manipulate virtual objects. So one participant said, but sure, it can tell me that the furniture fits in the room, but it doesn't tell me what it looks like once it's placed. The coffee table would fit in front of the couch, but how do I know which way it would fit? How do I know the long side of the coffee table is parallel to the long side of the couch? Um, and also including descriptions of physical objects could increase the safety of the application. So another participant said, I'm thinking of a situation where there's other things or other people moving around. If a camera is watching that, it might say, go forward and put this there. If something runs in front of you, is it gonna tell you to stop so you don't crash into them while you're moving a chair? Um, next, I wanna talk about some of the future work that this pro uh, project can help to inform. Um, so first I mentioned before that we chose three of the most common component types uh, to create accessible alternatives for. However, those three tasks are only a small subset of the tasks that we identified overall. So this slide shows all 14 task types that we categorized. And again, we only looked at making these three tasks accessible in our work. So a huge next step for this line of research is to look at the other 11 tasks and design accessible interactions for them as well. Um, and I wanna talk about some of the ideas and challenges for doing that. So one common task that we didn't uh, address in this work was to, uh, that apps often ask users to scan a specific object and then they use that object to place virtual content on top of. So Tonic, which is an AR chord dictionary for pianos is one example of this. Um, when the user opens the app, they're asked to scan their piano so that the chords can be overlaid on top of it. But if the scanning isn't successful, they're then asked to sort of place a virtual marker on the first and last keys of their keyboard. Uh, and then those markers are instead used for calibration. Um, however, both of these tasks are not currently accessible, um, but there is a lot of prior work that can inspire strategies for making accessible alternative interactions. For example, there's over a decade of research on supporting blind photography and enable, enabling users to center objects in frame. And similar techniques could be used continuously to help the object stay in frame as the user moves to scan different angles of it. And to mark, yeah, to mark specific physical locations in space like the piano keys, hand tracking or fiducial markers could be used. Uh, for example, in Tutorial Lens, which is a system for authoring interactive AR tutorials, the system uses a hand-mounted fiducial marker for, um, uh, for tracking the locations of buttons on a device. Um, and it then later uses that tracking to overlay an AR replay of someone using the device. So a similar system could be used to specify locations in AR in general. Um, so people could just reach out and touch the thing that they wanna track or the location that they wanna place something at. However, this does then limit the scale of the experience to whatever is in physical reach. Um, and AR applications often involve content outside of those bounds. So for example, in many room measuring applications, users are asked to place a virtual point at each corner of their room, even in the top corners of doorways and the corners of the ceiling. So a direct touch method wouldn't work in those cases. In the future, research should engage more with visually impaired people and other populations to design AR that's not only um, possible, but usable and desirable. Um, this could also potentially involve using other output modalities such as spatial audio or haptics. And finally, technical advances in providing semantic descriptions of a 3D space 
um, and answering complex layout questions are needed in order to advance accessible interaction techniques. And we also discuss more opportunities in our paper. So overall, this work demonstrates that AR can be made accessible to blind users um, and sets a roadmap for future work in that direction. Our design probes and evaluation show that providing continuous feedback is extremely important, as is mixing descriptions of the virtual and physical objects in order to make the entire AR scene understandable. Um, okay, so that's all that I have for this project. So I'll check the chat. I see there's some questions in here. Yep. Um, so I guess we can go ahead with my question and then we can go to Cameron's question. So I was wondering why did you decide specifically to design a solar system app for the prototype other than it fulfilling the requirement of being an educational app? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I didn't uh, get a chance to show it in this presentation, um, but there were actually um, a couple of solar system apps that we looked at. So that's one of the reasons, um, again, just to mimic something that was already existing. Um, and I guess as for a second reason, um, uh, it sort of provided an opportunity for us to explore a different kind of content. So for the solar system app, um, the content was in midair and it was moving around um, as opposed to the furniture app or, or other educational apps, which usually include things that are placed on a, on a tabletop. So we wanted to have some variety that way. Um, so yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, okay, yeah. that answers my question. Okay, cool. Um, and then I see there the question from Cameron, did the uh, mm -hmm. camera-based search use virtual objects or CV to detect real objects? Um, so yeah, our prototypes right now just were um, dealing with virtual objects. So um, we just used a sort of a basic gray cast in the AR app to, um, to see when the camera was aimed at a, at a virtual object that was in the scene, yeah. Have you, follow up question to that, have you uh, experimented at all with um, like object recognition um, for existing like furniture, for example, like to find a chair or find a doorway? Mm -hmm. um, we did use some very basic CVs, some off the shelf models um, to sort of, um, uh, give like a, a proximity. So for example, um, the case that we developed was like, let's say there was um, an Apple or a laptop on a table. Um, it could then, the app could then tell you, hey, there's a virtual object next to this physical thing. Um, I definitely think there is promise there. It's something that I would like to continue working on in the future. Um, I think the limitation that we ran into is that um, the models that we were trying to use just weren't uh, advanced enough. Um, so I think that could um, that could also potentially help in this case. Um, uh, I see the next question. Is it possible to get a copy of the paper? Yes, it's on my website and I'll have a link um, at the end of the talk. And then I see a question from Mahika. Do you want to ask this or should I just read it? <laughs> All right, I can um, read it, I guess. But mm -hmm. I was like, um, really great work on the different kinds of AR applications, by the way, I was wondering, like, how would you go about sort of bringing the enjoyment or the fun that we often get through like AR apps and games such as like Pokemon Go, um, where if it's just like reading out sort of what's being seen, that's like one mode of input. But if you had any like brainstorming ideas around there or just capturing the sort of like element of fun through AR. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's a great question. Something that we did not explore enough in this work, um, because you're totally right. A lot of the sort of fun and interest in, in AR sort of comes from the novelty or just the, the general experience of using it. Um, for me, I feel like at least with, um, you know, those kinds of apps, I feel like the fun often comes from seeing something that you're like, wow, this, how can this be real? Like, how can this Pokemon be sitting in my living room, right? Um, and I definitely think there is a way to replicate that. I think spatial audio, which I'll, I'll discuss a little bit when I talk about um, my next couple of projects, but I think that can sort of be the analog um, to those kinds of things. Um, 
if you can sort of mimic the experience of something being in your space and, and being with you, um, I think that's sort of a, a great way to bring the fun into those experiences. So um, yeah, we're looking at spatial audio more for function, but I, I definitely think it has some use there as well for, for fun. <laughs> Hey, Jalen. Uh, this is Dylan over here. Um, thanks so much for, for speaking. I loved, uh, I loved the talk. Um, one thing I was curious about is when it comes to distinguishing whether the app is talking about physical objects or virtual objects, um, was there any confusion with visually impaired users there? Yeah, I guess I should. So I should clarify that the prototypes that we had currently um, only talked about virtual objects. So that's probably one of the biggest limitations of our work is that um, all the speculation about what information should we convey about physical objects and how could that help, which it, it most likely definitely can help a lot. Um, we weren't really able to do a comparison um, in this context. Um, and actually, in, in I, I guess I sort of have a similar answer to what I um, gave to Mahika before is that um, in a future work, I'll talk about how we use different voice fonts and so different tones of voice to convey um, different information um, in a project relating to like uh, relating to making uh, Google Docs accessible. Um, so I feel like, you know, maybe different tones of voice could convey if something is physical or virtual um, or a different, like a different accent, like a robotic voice for the virtual content or something like that. Um, but yeah, I think there's a lot of sort of passive background channels like that that we can leverage in order to convey that information because one uh, consideration is we, we really don't want to overload people um, with, with way too much stuff going on. So um, yeah. Very cool, thank you. Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, I guess with that, just because I do have another 10 minutes left, I can continue on with the, the last two projects um, and then there'll be probably another uh, 10 minutes of questions there at the end if that sounds good. Um, okay, great. I will continue on then. Okay. So next, I, I wanted to expand on the roadmap that I presented at the beginning of the talk. So in the work that I just presented, we considered how to make existing single user mobile AR applications accessible. Um, but expanding on this, a large part of current and proposed AR applications are these multi-user productivity or social applications. Um, as AR can not only connect people to their environments, but also connect people to each other through collaborative applications. So this is also something to consider when thinking about accessibility. So one sort of baby step towards this is just in general, having a better understanding of how collaborative awareness is created and maintained in AR. So towards this, I'm also working on a project XSpace, which is a toolkit for creating AR applications that share pieces of a user's environmental context. And as another step, unfortunately, there are still many collaborative applications that aren't fully accessible in general. For example, collaborative writing software um, and understanding how to make collaborative cues accessible in general is a prerequisite to understanding how to make collaborative cues in AR accessible. So towards this goal, I'll also present a project Collab Ally, which aims to provide accessible collaborative collaboration awareness and document editing. Um, and then finally, based on Collab Ally and XSpace, I'll also share some insights that we have for what the future of accessible multi-user AR could consider. And again, all these projects are aimed at the same central goal of making all kinds of AR, both single and multi-user AR, fully accessible. Okay, so next I'll briefly discuss XSpace. So XSpace is a toolkit for enabling easier creation uh, of distributed multi-user AR applications. So um, situations where two users are each in their own separate environments that they want to collaborate using um, AR. And specifically, XSpace aims to share pieces of one user's environment with another when they're located in different places. Um, and this work is still ongoing, but I wanted to briefly share it just because it's inspired some ideas about how AR collaboration could be made accessible in the future. So XSpace was initiated based on the idea that environmental context is an important aspect of collaboration. And this is because how we interact with our environment can provide rich contextual information about our intents, needs, and actions, which facilitates effective communication between individuals. So for example, in this image, because the person is standing near the board, I might assume that they're about to add another sticky note to the list. 
And there's also a large amount of prior theoretical research to back this up. So for example, Benford et al. summarized many benefits of having shared spatial environments for collaboration, including creating a persistent context for ongoing activity, enabling a per peripheral awareness of others, facilitating chance encounters, and allowing for natural interactions with virtual content. In AR, we can potentially solve this issue by creating applications that adapt to and share aspects of each user space. So for example, let's say we have two people who are, again, geographically distributed across two environments who wanna collaborate. One is in a living room while the other is working from a small conference room. So one approach for adapting AR content to each of these spaces could be to try to find similarities between them in terms of the physical object affordances um, and grouping content that way. So here, both spaces have a table, both spaces have some seats, both spaces have something on the wall. Um, so we're grouping the virtual content sort of by these, by these physical affordances. Um, and again, the goal here is to create a shared virtual space or environment that can unify these spaces and facilitate things like shared references. Um, on the other hand, we still wanna take each user's uh, physical environment into account so that we can create an AR experience that remains contextual for them. Um, however, these sketches represent just one possible way of doing that. So another way to do this is to directly share pieces of a user's scanned environmental mesh and overlay them onto another user's environment. So this video shows a social game that was developed with Xspace. And in this clip, I can see part of a remote user's environment overlaid onto my own. So I can see their couch and their table here in yellow. And then in the game, we're throwing snowballs at each other. So I can see when a snowball collides with some of their furniture. I'll play this clip. So again, I can see when the snowballs collide with my environment, with the other player, and with their environment, um, highlighting how having a, the shared context can sort of create a shared space for play in this, in this case. So when we think about making multi-user AR accessible, uh, one open question is what collaborative cues need to be captured um, and shared? So inspired by Xspace, one important cue is a person's relationship to their environment. So how they're interacting with the physical objects around them. Um, and this might be their proximity to certain things, what they're looking at, are they sitting or standing, um, any of that kind of information that can provide a, that uh, extra level of additional context about what they're doing. Um, and again, to answer this question, we can take inspiration from existing assistive applications, in this case, PeopleLens. So PeopleLens uses an AR headset to provide blind students access to real-time social cues, such as identifying people around the wear and notifying them if someone's looking in their direction to initiate conversation. So accessible multi-user AR could consider sharing similar cues, such as collaborators gaze or pointing gestures. Um, and then next, I'll talk about a project called Collab Ally. So Collab Ally is a system which aims to make collaboration awareness and document editing accessible. And this work was recently presented at a, as a demo at Assets. So in current collaborative document editing practices, blind people encounter various challenges to understanding collaborators' behaviors. So first, visual cues such as color-coded highlights that can provide a passive awareness are not accessible. Second, various parts of the interface, such as reading and adding comments, are hard to navigate, making the interaction extremely time consuming. And third, there is a limited access to collaborators' real time behaviors, such as their typing or cursor movements. So these are the collaborative cues that we aim to convey with our system, Collab Ally. To address these challenges, Collab Ally is a browser extension that provides access to collaborator information and activities in a variety of ways. So first, Collab Ally provides an on-demand interface for reading collaborator locations, comments, and text changes. Second, Collab Ally also uses background ear cons to convey collaborator activity. And finally, Collab Ally conveys information using different audio forms, like spatial audio, to convey the relative proximity of collaborator activity, and voice fonts to distinguish between collaborators. So this video clip shows one of our co-authors who is blind um, accessing Collab Allies collaborator information and then using the voice fonts and spatial audio to determine who the collaborator is and where they are in the document. 
First of all, I wonder if there are any other collaborators on our team that are in the current document with me. Let me press Alt Shift 1. In the dialog box, I'm going to press H key to go to the next heading. The collaborator sum summary here. There are two collaborators. First collaborator is Renee Jones. Let me click this by pressing spacebar. Renee I hear female voice of font on my right. I wonder the specific location. I hear this spatial audio sound on my coming from my right. I understand this a uh, little bit below from my current location. Let me go to the next collaborator by pressing H key. Marcos Valdez. Here is Marcos. Top of page six. Now I hear this male voice font coming from farther right corner that indicates he's located at the bottom. Okay, and then this next video clip shows the background audio that Collab Ally uses um, to convey different collaborator activities. Oh, I hear the sound. Um, somebody has just joined, maybe Renee. Oh, this ear can indicate somebody has just came to the same paragraphs as mine. I wonder who that is. And oh, somebody has just left a comment. Let me check it out by pressing Alt Shift 1. Okay, so again, thinking about how to make, uh, thinking about making multi user AR accessible, um, inspired by Collab Ally, change, uh, sharing changes or updates that are made to shared content is also an important aspect. Another open question in making multi user AR accessible is how to convey this information about collaborators. So, taking our findings from Collab Ally, what we learned is that it's important to provide both on-demand access to detailed information, um, as well as provide the option for continuous unobtrusive background updates. We also observe that spatial audio can be used to convey the location or proximity of changes, and that personalized audio like voice fonts can help differentiate between collaborators. Okay, so today I presented three projects, all which relate to the broad goal of making both single and multi-user AR fully accessible. And throughout this presentation, I tried to give examples of how prior work on AR-enabled assistive applications has influenced our work on making AR accessible. And my hope is that these two lines of research will continue to influence each other and contribute to each other, and ultimately lead towards a future of AR that's both accessible and useful to everyone. Um, so with that, I will continue to take questions. Um, thank you all again so much for attending today. Um, Sorry, I'm just looking through the chat. Um, Cameron, I did yeah. see that link that you posted. So thank you so much for that. I will definitely check it out. Um, I had a question that I couldn't ask before, but I will, mm -hmm. I'm quite curious about it. Um, have you already thought about uh, in what ways are you going to co-design the AR experience? Uh, with visually impaired people, or it's still you're still thinking about it? Yeah, that's actually a great question because it's sort of a well, sort of a question that I'm currently trying to <laughs> answer. And in the next phase of this work, we really want to do some co-designing. Um, I think the so the attitude that we had with our, the first project initially was um, sort of it's it's hard to co-design without any sort of artifact. And like I said, the existing AR apps, if you try to use them with a screen reader, you literally can only learn the buttons there on the screen. Um, so I guess my hope is that um, the prototypes that we develop can kind of serve as a starting point for that sort of discussion. So if people use them, then they can get a better idea of what AR is and what it might look like. And then from there, um, that can maybe serve as a jumping off point for future discussions. Um, I guess that's sort of yeah, that's the initial um, initial thought, but I, I definitely agree that it's a very challenging question. <laughs> so, yeah. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Hey, Jalen. 
I was going to say this is uh, this is some some awesome stuff. Uh, I'd I'd love to know if you could get any of the the like platform owners like Google or or Android iOS to implement anything that you've shown here today. What what would be your top pick? Oh gosh, um, <laughs> I mean, I don't. Okay, maybe I don't want to say the boring answer, but I think for me the most obvious answer is. The stuff from Collab Ally, I think, is probably the most important. Um, and that's not to say having accessible AR isn't important at all. Um, but I think for Google Docs, it's something that people use daily in their work, and it, it genuinely is just not accessible. Um, so that was one of the most frustrating, I think, things I learned in this line of work is just that there's still so many accessibility challenges. And you would think, oh, Google Docs is a pretty mature tool. Um, why isn't there support for these basic features? Um, but there really isn't. So I think that's sort of the the boring non-AR answer, but I, I I do think that genuinely is the most important. I think if I um, if I was going to give an answer maybe more relating to AR, um, it would actually be something that I, I didn't necessarily show today, but um, as part of the accessible AR prototypes that we developed, um, one of the most basic prototypes before we got to any of those interactions um, was just making sort of an AR screen reader. So um, normally in the screen reader on iOS, someone swipes and then they can uh, read through like a list of text or a list of buttons. Um, so we just uh, exposed like the 3D content uh, as a list. So a person could swipe through and hear, you know, there's a chair, there's a, a couch, there's a, a table here, a virtual. So they could swipe through the list of virtual objects that way. Um, and I feel like that would be probably the, the starting point. Um, that I would like to see implemented just because I think that's something so basic, at least you could learn, start to learn what's around you. Um, while I really like the prototypes that we developed, I, I can't really claim that they're mature enough yet to be to be fully deployed on onto existing platforms. So I don't think I'd give that as, a, as an answer. Yeah, but that's a great question. Awesome. Thank you. And I think we had a few more questions in chat as well. Yeah, I see. What were some of the challenges that participants faced with Collab Ally? Um, yeah, so um, I think I think we we did try to make those uh, audio cues as intuitive as possible. So like the spatial audio left to right um, and the voice fonts. You know, we tried to make that as intuitive as possible, but there is a little bit of a learning curve with those things, um, as well as with the background audio. So we had three background audio alerts. Um, and I guess overall, what we saw with all of those different forms of audio is people really wanted to personalize them a lot more. Um, so they wanted to say, um, hey, I want this background alert, but I don't really care about these things. Um, you know, that sort of thing. So I think that was, that, that'll that hopefully be in our in our version two Club Ally, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, thanks for answering that. Yeah, I think we had another question by Cameron. Oh, yeah. Oh, and I guess this is pretty similar, yeah, to, to what I just said. So um, people did want to have like maybe their own custom things. We did try to make some of them a bit more like literal earcon. So for example, for the deleting comment earcon, we used a um, like uh, crumpling paper, sort of like a trash sound, I guess. Um, but overall, we uh, when we were like researching or trying to find what different sounds could we actually use, it was actually quite tricky to find things that were totally literal for for all of these cues. So um, I think that was that's something that I think could also be uh, improved on as well, or letting people customize and choose their own. Yeah. Cool. And thanks, Dylan, for putting my info in the chat as well. Um, yeah, if anyone's interested in in getting links to the papers, they're on my website. So um, that is in the in the chat. Yeah. <laughs> and the newsletter. I'll plug the newsletter because um, it's great. I'm actually subscribed to it. I attended the XR Access Initiative in 2019. I think the, the very first meetup. It was great. So I was super happy to be invited today. So. Um, yeah, I guess with that, um, I can stop sharing.
yeah and I'll just say thank you guys again for having me um and there's some some links on the screen for um for XR access stuff as well so yeah. thank you guys <laughs> thank you Dylan um I'll just go over this quickly we would love to have all of you who are attending um you know stick around for future seminars and we'd love to have you on our slack channel um, and become a member of one of our work streams. So you can follow us on Twitter at, at @xraccess. Email us at info at xraccess.org. Um, and there are many other ways to get involved, like institutional membership, if you are a company or a university interested in more close collaboration with XR Access. Um, so thank you again to Jalen. And I will um, hand it back to Ricardo and Mejica to give you a preview of our next speaker. Yeah, um, we can sort of just quickly wrap up, but next speaker that we have coming up in January or February date to be decided um, is Mar Gonzalez Franco. Um, she's a principal researcher at uh, Microsoft at the Extended Perception Interaction and Cognition team. Um, lots of cool work by Mar and we're really, really excited to have her. And she's done multiple AR VR projects and um, we're, yeah, we're super stoked for that. And we'll talk more about it through our channels like we mentioned on Twitter or Slack. I'll go back um, another page. Um, that was our Slack and Twitter link and we'll keep you all updated on when that's happening. Thanks for coming everyone. And thanks Jalen for the amazing talk. <laughs>